Thanks for joining today's webinar. Our topic is Western blot normalization, what you need to know. Our speaker is Dr. Amy Geschwender, Principal Scientist for LICOR Biosciences. Dr. Geschwender received her PhD in Molecular and Cellular Biology from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Since joining LICOR in 1998, she has spent much of her career developing fluorescence imaging tools for biomedical research. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Geschwender, Principal Scientist with LICOR Biosciences, and we're glad that you could join us today. Our topic today is Western blot normalization, what you need to know. Imagine living in a perfect world and doing the perfect Western blot. Normalization would never be needed. You would use freshly calibrated pipettes to expertly load exactly the same amount of sample protein in every lane. And your target protein bands would perfectly reflect the level of protein expression in each sample. And every paper published would contain all the technical details you would need to critically evaluate those results. Does your world look like that? Or maybe it looks a little more like this. Because here in the real world, our Western blots are never perfect. No matter how hard we try, we can't control every source of variability. And that's what normalization is for, to make our imperfect blots a little more perfect. So that when you don't load exactly the same amount of sample protein in every lane, normalization can help you correct for that variability and allow you to estimate what your target protein signals would be like under more perfect conditions. But normalization isn't a magic wand or a cure for sloppiness. Uh, you can't just create solid data out of a flawed experiment, but you can understand and minimize sources of variability in your procedure, and you can think about your normalization method and how it affects your data. Now, fortunately, we continue to learn more about where variability sneaks in and what kind of controls are important. And with this deeper understanding, uh, we do a better job of addressing the how and why that variability threatens your perfect blot and the most accurate ways to overcome it and generate results that are closer to this ideal. The NIH is also pretty interested in how variability affects our ideal outcomes and alters our experimental results. And they're asking for robust, unbiased experimental design, methodology, analysis, and interpretation of results along with full reporting of experimental details so that others can reproduce and extend your findings. In other words, researchers should know more about the techniques that we use and provide enough detail for readers and reviewers to see how that data came together. In addition, journals are now implementing new reporting standards and asking you to fully report the methods and data analysis with enough detail for the reader to understand how you collected that data, how you analyzed it, and how you reached your conclusions. As Dr. David Drubin put it during the NIH workshop on data integrity and cell biology, scientists need to understand sources of variance in their system and communicate those sources. To do that, you should critically evaluate how your methods work and where variability and error are introduced. And be prepared then to explain why your methods and your controls are accurate and appropriate for your experiment. Well, what does all this mean for Western blots? It means that authors should be prepared to meet new standards, particularly for quantitative Western blot analysis. The editorial board of the Journal of Biological Chemistry recently looked at these issues very carefully. And in December of 2015, they published an editorial on this topic and issued extensive revisions to their instructions for authors. The editorial board identified three major gaps in data reporting in life science. And one of those three gaps was specific to Western blotting, leading to what they call revised JBC guidelines for presentation and quantitation of immunowestern blots. The JBC is now asking authors and reviewers to look much more closely at Western blot data and how those data are collected and reported. According to these new guidelines, the authors should clearly explain how quantitative data were obtained, whether signal intensity has a linear relationship with antigen loading, and how protein loading was normalized among lanes. <laughs> 
And throughout today's talk, I'll show you more specifics from the JBC about these new expectations for a publication of Western blot data. This isn't just something you can expect in the future. These changes are already happening, and today's webinar is all about what you need to know now to be prepared for it. We're going to talk about using common internal loading controls for normalization, the attributes of a great internal control, sources of variability, and the impact of normalization on data analysis and coefficient of variation to help you collect rock-solid data that will meet even the toughest publication standards, whether you're submitting that paper or grant next week, next month, or next year. Now, these terms get tossed around an awful lot, so I want to start by establishing some definitions. Western blot normalization mathematically corrects for small and unavoidable sample-to-sample -sample and lane-to-lane -lane variability. And it does that by comparing the protein of interest to an internal loading control. That internal loading control is your indicator or readout of sample concentration and cell number, and it's the thing that enables relative comparison of protein levels across your blot. The internal loading control should be an endogenous protein or proteins that's present in all samples and is not affected by your experiment so that the abundance of this control is predictive of sample concentration. So why is this loading control so important? Well, it's important because you need to be confident that the changes you see in band intensity reflect actual change in the biology and biochemistry of your protein samples. So if you see a bunch of different band intensities, you need to know, do those changes represent changing levels of target protein expression, or did they come from variability in sample prep or loading or transfer? So if you've loaded your samples very consistently, shown in these gray bars here, then varying band intensities probably show you varying levels of your target protein. But on the flip side, if your sample loading is all over the place, as you see in these gray bars, it might be that your target protein level is actually pretty stable, and the variability makes it appear to be changing. With an accurate, appropriate internal loading control, you can be confident that you're basing your conclusions and your future experiments on the most accurate and most reliable quantitative Western results. The common internal loading controls fall into three categories. Internal reference proteins, or housekeeping proteins, total protein staining, and pan analysis, which uses antibodies to examine post-translational modifications. The first strategy uses a single reference point, an internal reference protein that's an unrelated endogenous protein found in all of your samples and expressed at a stable level. That protein is your indirect readout of sample concentration, and it's typically a housekeeping protein like actin, tubulin, or GAP-DH. This next strategy is a bit different. Total protein staining uses many reference points. It typically measures the sum of many protein signals in each lane, and it's commonly performed by membrane staining after transfer. But it can also be done by irreversible covalent labeling of your sample proteins. For example, the BioRad stain-free system or the Amersham Western blot system, which both use a labeling of sample proteins with fluorescent dyes. And later I'll talk a little bit more about covalent labeling methods and how they might impact your data. The pan analysis method actually uses the target protein as its own internal control because it combines a phospho-specific antibody with a so-called pan-specific antibody that recognizes your target protein regardless of its modification state. This multiplex fluorescent method is used to analyze changes in target protein phosphorylation or other post-translational modifications. So there's more than one way to perform Western blot normalization. You have options, but which one should you choose? Well, the key point I want to make today is that accurate Western blot normalization is a strategy, not just a step that you add on at the very end of the protocol. And correcting for variability should be a part of your plan from the very beginning. I think of it 
like approaching normalization as if it were the dessert tray at a restaurant where, you know, you have dinner and then at the end of the meal, the server comes by with this tray full of goodies and you think, oh my gosh, do I have room for dessert? Should I pick something? Should I not? But for the most accurate and most precise Western blot data, your normalization strategy should be planned in advance, kind of like saving room for that dessert so that before you start, you choose a normalization method that's appropriate for your experiment and for the type of data analysis that you want to perform. How can you manage Western blot variability and increase the accuracy of your results? Well, there are, there are two important ways. You can reduce it with careful experimental design to identify and eliminate sources of error. And you can correct for it using an appropriate internal loading control for Western blot normalization. To reduce variability by experimental design, you can limit the inherent variability of your samples and methods and then minimize the amount of correction that is applied by normalization. That will give you smaller error bars and will allow you to detect changes in protein expression more reliably. There are two excellent papers that cover this topic in detail uh, that I highly recommend reading them. But don't worry about writing down the citations during the webinar um, because we'll email you a PDF handout after the presentation with all of these links and citations. You also correct for variability with Western blot normalization using an appropriate internal control that is an accurate indicator of sample concentration and cell number. How do you choose that loading control? Well, that's actually a really critical step in the Western bot process because that loading control is what enables relative comparison of protein levels across your blot, and it's what determines how accurately you will correct for variability when you normalize. So what's the best choice? Well, I'm sorry to say that no single method will always be the best because your experiments are not one-size-fits-all. There are several valid methods. Housekeeping proteins may not always be the best choice, but they're also not always a bad choice. The key is to use your scientific judgment to evaluate the context and biology of your experiment because the sources of biological and technical variability can be different in each experiment. So go into it with your eyes open and choose a loading control that's appropriate for the sources of variability in your cells, your tissues, and your experimental conditions. To choose and use an appropriate internal loading control, you need to understand the implications of the core principle of normalization, which I'll show you in a minute, and how your internal loading control affects data analysis and statistics. The core principle of normalization states that the target and internal loading control signals must vary to the same degree with sample concentration. So both of them must be dependent on and proportional to sample concentration. Your target and control signals will then go up and down together and give you a consistent target to control ratio in all experimental samples. The core principle also tells us a couple of important things about the attributes of an accurate and effective internal loading control. The signal intensity of that control must be proportional to sample concentration and also proportional to the abundance of the control. Without those characteristics, the internal loading control cannot accurately correct for variability and could even introduce variability and noise into data analysis, which makes it harder to detect actual changes in your samples. It's also important to correct for variation at all stages of the Western blot process, and of course, to be compatible with immunodetection of your target proteins. For the rest of the webinar, we will examine each common type of loading control using that core principle to evaluate the strengths and limitations of the method and its impact on quantitative Western blot analysis. So we'll start with internal reference proteins uh, using a housekeeping protein for normalization. This is a widely used, widely published, and accepted method, and I've shown a couple of examples from the literature here. To evaluate this method, we're going to look back to what we just learned from the core principle, 
we learned that the signal intensity of the control must be proportional to sample concentration. That means that expression of the control protein must be constant across all samples and unaffected by your experimental conditions. But because a single indicator is used, this method is definitely sensitive to biological variability in the expression of that control protein. Using a housekeeping protein actually makes a subtle change in your hypothesis because you want to know the abundance of your target relative to sample concentration, but what you're actually measuring is an indirect readout, and now you're looking at the abundance of your target relative to actin concentration or tubulin concentration or whatever reference protein that you use. And if abundance of that reference is changing, if it's affected somehow by your experiment, then there could be a problem. Stable protein levels have always been assumed for housekeeping proteins, but it may not always be the case. Housekeeping protein expression is actually known now to vary in response to some experimental conditions and biological factors. This paper, Greer et al., is one of the most widely cited examples. This study shows that in cell culture, the cell density can greatly affect expression of housekeeping genes. In fact, both alpha tubulin and gap DH increase significantly in expression with higher cell density, while in the same samples, beta actin and HSP90 were unaffected. Evidence like this has led the JBC to revise its instructions for authors, stating that housekeeping proteins should not be used for normalization without evidence that experimental manipulations do not affect their expression. This 2012 study demonstrates that housekeeping proteins can be affected by the stage of development of your samples. So this laboratory was looking for a stable and reliable internal reference for their work on retinal development in rats, and they tested several candidates, discovering that both actin and tubulin were not stably expressed during this stage of retinal development. So let's look at the actin signals first here, highlighted in purple. You can see that signal is very high in this first embryonic sample, but it steadily decreases across the course of development. So it's not an appropriate loading control. But one protein this lab tested actually did show stable expression and development. It was actually MAP kinase 1, which is highlighted here in orange. So you can see from the orange line that MAP K1 levels are stable in these samples. So in this particular context, MAP kinase, a signaling protein, is stably expressed and would be a good candidate as an internal reference, but actin and tubulin would not be good candidates. When you use a single reference point, your data are more sensitive to the biological variability that comes from experimental treatments, disease, cell type, and other factors. And that variability will increase the mean CV of the normalized data. Now, the problem is that high CVs may cause false negatives, which are small and genuine changes in your target protein that are overlooked by your data analysis. The core principle also tells us that signal intensity of the control must be proportional to sample concentration. And the issue here is that signal saturation frequently affects normalization in part because we usually choose a highly abundant protein to be that internal reference. Signal saturation is what occurs when the signal intensity from a band is too bright for the detector to actually record it. And this is common with film and even with conventional CCD imagers. When that occurs, the signal intensity recorded is no longer proportional to abundance of control. Saturation causes these strong bands to be underestimated, particularly when film is used for detection. Here's an example of signal saturation on film showing that saturation problem. This target protein here is detected in serial dilutions of NIH 3T3 cell lysates. And the linear range of this film exposure is very small. It is actually only these three bands and the strong bands begin to saturate very quickly. Because of saturation, the optical density of those strong bands is dramatically underestimated. 
the signal intensity here should be shooting straight up, but instead you get this abrupt plateau. And even though increasing amounts of lysate are loaded, the OD values for these bands are all very similar because saturation is concealing the actual variation between those bands. When your bands saturate, you lose data. And this graph illustrates the densitometry results for a film exposure with dark bands. So four different samples were loaded, and all of the bands have pretty similar OD values. But saturated bands can appear to be similar even when they're not, because when you approach this saturation ceiling, you begin to lose your ability to detect differences in band intensity. These OD values are limited, and some of the actual band intensity is lost. So what I show here in the darker blue is information about your bands that couldn't be captured, and losing this information will affect your data analysis. If you compare the detected signals for sample 2 and 3, you would observe a 10% difference. But that's underestimating the actual difference between these bands. The band in sample number 2 is actually more than twice as intense as sample 3. And if you could capture all of the signal, you would find about a 120% difference between the two bands. To summarize, housekeeping proteins can be suitable as internal reference proteins. This can be an accurate method, but you should make sure that you're measuring what you think you're measuring. So it's important to check that core principle. Because vi biological variability can introduce error, you should check for stable expression of the loading control under your experimental conditions. And because signal saturation can alter your data, you should also validate the linear range of detection for your specific antibodies, your sample concentrations, and your detection method. Next, we'll talk about total protein staining for normalization. This approach uses total sample protein as a direct readout. And it's really like normalization by committee because it uses the sum of many reference points, many protein signals, to estimate the sample concentration in each lane. And this is an antibody-independent method. Total protein normalization is performed by staining a replicate gel with Kumasi, or even better, by staining the actual membrane after transfer. It's also sometimes done by covalent pre-labeling of sample proteins with fluorescent dyes. In December 2015, the Journal of Biological Chemistry issued new recommendations for normalization, indicating that normalization of signal intensity to total protein loading, assessed by staining membranes using Kumasi Blue, Ponso S, or other protein stains, is preferred. So we'll follow that JBC recommendation and start by talking about total protein staining after membrane transfer. This method corrects for variability in the actual amount of sample protein present on the blot in each lane, including the variation that arises during transfer. And this technique is able to monitor protein transfer across your entire blot and at all molecular weights. After transfer, you stain the membrane and then image the total protein signals with near-infrared fluorescence, creating this image that can be quantified. So you draw a region around all or part of each lane to quantify the sum of the fluorescent bands in that region. Once the total protein signal is imaged, the membrane is then used for Western blotting. And you can learn more about how this works by registering for our upcoming webinar, Normalization Methods for Quantitative Analysis of Western Blots, which is taking place on October 11th. This experiment here shows total protein staining in action. Four different NIH 3T3 cell lysate samples are loaded on this blot. And then it was incubated with the protein stain to generate this image that can be used to quantify total sample protein in each of the lanes. Then the target protein was detected on that same membrane by Western blotting, and ERK, the target protein, was quantified in each lane. The raw data show a range of signal intensity for that target in these samples. But we can't be certain that this indicates different levels of target protein expression. However, normalization to total protein staining really clarifies 
the meaning of those results. On this particular blot, you can see even visually that sample concentration and sample loading were a little bit inconsistent. And when we use that information to correct for loading variation, we actually see that the target protein levels are pretty stable in these samples. So how does total protein staining measure up? Well, let's go back to what we learned from that core principle. First of all, we recall that signal intensity of the loading control must be proportional to sample concentration. And that's true for total protein staining. It uses the sum of many reference points, and it directly measures the amount of sample protein on the blot. So it's a very relevant internal control. And that is really the greatest strength of total protein staining. That's why this method is so much less sensitive to biological variability. And it's why total protein staining is really emerging now as the new gold standard for Western blot normalization and the standard that's explicitly recommended by the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Total protein staining reduces the impact of biological variability, and it is less likely to introduce error. This method redistributes error in your raw data and reduces the overall mean CV of the normalized data. That core principle, you'll recall, also tells us that signal intensity should be proportional to abundance of the control. So it's important for you to validate the linear range of the staining method that you use and to always keep your sample loading in the middle of that linear range. But one major benefit of total protein staining compared to a housekeeping protein is that revalidation is not needed for different antibodies or different experimental conditions. This experiment here compares the linear range of detection on Westerns for actin, a housekeeping protein, and for total protein staining. So you see here for actin that as the amount of lysate perlane increases, the actin signal goes up and it does give you a region of linear response. But that falls apart pretty quickly. That linear response is lost pretty early, and signal intensity is not proportional to the abundance of control. However, total protein staining gives a linear and proportional signal response across the entire range of concentrations. Total protein staining also has other attributes of an accurate control. It corrects for variation at all stages in the process, and is generally compatible with immunodetection. But it's unclear if these things are also true of methods that use covalent labeling of your sample proteins. So let's look at that briefly. The Biorad stain-free system and the Amersham Western blot system are both covalent pre-labeling methods that couple fluorescent dyes to your sample proteins for visualization. Stain-free uses a trihalo compound that's in the gel matrix and is coupled to your sample proteins by UV crosslinking. Whereas the Amershen system uses amine reactive Psi 5 dye for sample labeling prior to protein electrophoresis. Do these methods have the attributes of an accurate loading control? Well, covalent methods are sensitive to biological variability because their labeling is directed against a specific amino acid. So in the stain-free system, that's tryptophan, and in the Amersham system, that's the primary amine groups on lysine residues. Because amino acid composition is variable, you would expect to get protein-to-protein -protein variation, and the extent of labeling can be inconsistent across samples. Chemical modification of epitopes can interfere with antibody binding and introduce variability. This experiment here from Biorad scientists shows how stain-free labeling can affect quantitative analysis if your epitope contains a trip residue. So on this control blot, there's no UV crosslinking of the label, and you see a nice increase in signal as increasing amounts of hemoglobin are loaded. But when the label is UV crosslinked and chemically modifies trip residues, that antibody recognition is disrupted. And this black line shows a dramatic reduction in signal after UV crosslinking. It's actually a 79% mean loss of signal in this experiment. Covalent labeling can be inconsistent and variable because it's affected by a variety of factors. 
It can interfere with electrophoresis and transfer, and as we just saw, it may also affect immunodetection. Overall, total protein normalization is a very relevant control that reduces the impact of biological variability. And total protein staining of membranes after transfer is becoming the new gold standard for Western blot normalization. Before we wrap up, I'll just briefly mention the pan phospho strategy for phosphorylation analysis. This approach combines a phospho-specific antibody with a pan-specific antibody. And in multiplex fluorescent detection, you can monitor changes in the phosphorylation of that target protein or track other post-translational modifications. This approach is actually specifically recommended by the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Uh, their instructions for authors states that signals obtained using antibodies specific for phosphorylated epitopes should be normalized to the total protein level of the target protein. This approach is a great tool for quantitative analysis because it avoids the variation introduced by stripping and reprobing of blots, a topic that's examined very closely in this 2015 science signaling paper. You can use this approach to analyze a variety of protein modifications, including in vivo ubiquitination, which is shown here. And if you want to learn more about analyzing post-translational modifications, be sure to register for that upcoming webinar on October 11th. Our time is about up, uh, so I will wrap up by summarizing the take-home messages about Western blot normalization. There are several valid methods. And the key is to understand how each method works so you can select the most appropriate and most relevant internal loading control. A control that fits the context and biology of your experiment so you can accurately and effectively correct for variability. Because change isn't just coming, it's already in progress. And you should have confidence that the data you collect today will meet your needs not just today but also in the future when you publish and present those results. Thank you so much for attending today. We're going to close with a few minutes of Q&A, so just submit your questions through the chat window or even follow up with me later by email. And you'll soon get a follow-up email from us with a link to this recording and a participant handout with all the references and links from today's talk.